We're so excited every year to walk alongside sixth graders as they get confirmed in the church, as they make the decision to join the church, some of them to make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ for the first time. And this year, we have just shy of 60 baptisms, 225 confirmands. Um, 11 of those confirmands are out at our Wood Forest campus. Four of those baptisms are out at Wood Forest. It's such a phenomenal opportunity for our kiddos to learn about Jesus. Confirmation has been very important to our family. Um, we've done it twice now uh, with both boys, and it's been very influential in uh, not only their lives with Christ, but also ours. And we've really walked down the path to, to Christ together. We've spent a lot of time together this year, fellowshipping with one another, and just you see their growth in Christ, and not something that you want to give to them, but something that they grow from the inside, building that relationship the first opportunity as they're approaching their teenage years that they're able to say, I, I'm making this a priority. I'm making my faith a priority. It's a very proud moment um, as parents to see. Our relationship with Christ has grown tremendously and I think it's grown because I have been just spending so much more time learning about the Bible and what it really means to me. I just find it very truthful. Confirmation is important to me because I've gotten to know God better. I've gotten more knowledge about Him, and I've also gained some friends. Really gave us a framework to uh, serve as a uh, sort of a baseline for having discussions in our family about the Word of God. Uh, as we're working through different things in the Bible, these topics were coming up at the dinner table as well. So I think it gave us a really unique uh, opportunity and a specific time to talk about these things. He comes home to ask questions, we'll look stuff up, or he'll, he'll test our knowledge, and a lot of times he knows more than we do. He's a very open kid, and he's showing his brother and sister a good path. My favorite part of confirmation um, was the fall retreat, because I got to come closer with my friends and learn more about Jesus. Just getting to know everybody, what they like, and I walk in just feeling very comfortable and familiar with everybody. I got to spend time with my mom, meet new friends, and worship the Lord all at the same time. It's an incredible journey to God. You really get a sense of community with your church, and you find your village, you find your people, and um, God confirms that for us. give all of our confirmation kids a round of applause. You guys. You're there. You made it. It was a year. These, you know, these kids have spent literally like an entire school year just studying the word of God. And coming to this place, we call this sacred moments confirmation because this truly is a sacred moment in the life of our church. It's a big thing that these young people are stepping into today. Many um, have professed their faith in Jesus Christ. We celebrated outside in the fountain yesterday um, something like 35 baptisms that we had in the fountain. It was pretty sweet. God loves to show off when we baptized the very last child that came out of the water. The bells rang at noon. That's just God showing off. We didn't plan that. Many, we saw baptisms this morning. We have some more at 11. And this afternoon, after our 11 o'clock service, around 12.15 or 12.30, in the sanctuary, 225 young people. We, as a pastoral staff, a pastoral team, we are gonna lay hands on 225 sweet little heads, all of your heads, and we are gonna say your first and middle name, and you are gonna answer the vows of membership to the church. Question number one, do you profess your faith in Jesus Christ? Question number two, do you recognize the Old and the New Testament as one story of God's pursuit after the hearts of his children? And question number three, will you support the church with your prayers, with your presence, with your gifts, with your service, and with your witness? And this afternoon, around 1.15, our church membership will bump up by 225 souls. I've heard it said once. A pastor said, and I think with the best of intentions, he, he made the observation that, you know, the youth are the church of tomorrow. 
But my pushback on that is there can be nothing more destructive than having that mentality because I want you guys to know, we as the church don't want to wait for you to be the church tomorrow. We want you to know that you are the church of today. And God's people said, amen. I need you living lives where you are pursuing your relationship with the Lord, where you are loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbors yourself. So pat on the back, everybody, physical pat on the back. You finished confirmation. Guess what? Good job. This is the beginning of a very long journey. So I got a word that I want to bring to you today. It comes from 1 Timothy. It's a word for you, but parents, grandparents, adults, singles, wherever you are, we are all students in faith. We are all students in faith. And this is a really sweet message today. It comes from 1 Timothy. So I just want to pray. Um, anytime we open up the word, anytime I bring a word, I, I think when we're talking about freedom, when we're talking about who God has called us to be, about deepening our relationship with the Lord, I think the spiritual forces of darkness tremble a little bit. So I love to center ourselves. So just join me in a quick word of prayer, will you? Gracious and loving God, I'm so thankful for these sweet faces that are in front of me now. Father, for these young people, well done, good and faithful servants who have done the work. Lord, for the color group leaders, for the parents, for the volunteers, for our children's ministry. God, what a gift to just see how you're using these lives. So Lord, I pray right now, just over this word, over this message, that Father, the seed that is shared through the sharing of this word, that Lord, it would just cultivate in hearts, that it would continue to grow us into your likeness for as long as there is breath in our lungs. Gracious and loving Father, you're not finished with our story. So for these stories that we celebrate, beginning this chapter, God, I just pray a covering and a blessing over every one of them, and it's in your name that we pray, amen. In 2017, NASA, have you heard of NASA? It's a thing. NASA posted a job opening, and this is the position that they were looking for, planetary protection officer. Awesome, sign me up. If it comes with like a spaceship and a photon gun, who doesn't want to be planetary protection officer? I've seen all the Guardians of the Galaxy. I think I'm qualified. Now, if you're excited about it, calm down because there is a job description that goes with that title, planetary protection officer. Here's the job description. A position responsible for the microbial footprint of humans during interplanetary exploration. You need some knowledge in these areas if you're interested in applying physics, biology, chemistry, mathematics, engineering. I am not qualified. Okay. Needless to say, this was 2017, they filled the position, but why I share the story is because I love this so much. They got interest from all around the country. In fact, people were applying, very qualified people were applying for this job all around the world. But there was one applicant who sent in a letter to NASA that really caught their attention. I've, I've got his picture to show you. His name is Jack Davis. Now. Jack is nine years old and somehow he got wind of this and he found NASA's address and he sent them a letter. Let me read some of the letter to you, it's pretty awesome. Jack said, I may be nine, but I think I would be fit for the job. Why? One of the reasons is that my sister says that I'm an alien all the time. He also makes the very good point, also I have seen almost all of the space movies and alien movies that there are to see. He then said for further, um, for further study, he was committing to watch all of the Men in Black movies. That's awesome. <laughs> Just watch the first Jack, don't watch any of the others. Also, he said, by the way, here's how he sealed the deal, I'm young so I can learn to think like an alien. Well done, Jack Davis. Um, shoot for the stars. He literally took that, literally. Um, here's what I love about this. I love that NASA would send him back a letter that would say, hey, Jack, thank you so much for applying. Unfortunately, won't, won't, there's the word. We have a few other people who are qualified for the position, but they told him, here's what we want you to do. We want you to continue to study, continue to work in school, continue to get, get, great, get great grades, and then we have no doubts at some point on down the road you will be working for NASA. The thing that inspires me about this is just this childlike faith that Jack had, this ability. At what point, adults, let me talk to you. 
At what point do we just grow up and we lose a little bit of that that wonder, a little bit of that awe. I mean, if you look at kids when they color, they don't care about lines, do they? They don't care about coloring outside of the lines, but somewhere along the way, we begin to get smaller and smaller and smaller. But the beauty of who God is, the beauty of the creator of the universe is that God is all about wonder. In fact, Jesus would say that if you wanna get the kingdom of heaven, then you need to approach it like a little, someone say it, child, like a kid. There's a quote that I love. It comes from G.K. Chesterton. Now I know, church, if you know me, I throw a lot of quotes at you because I find a lot of inspiration from a lot of different books. But I'm telling you, of all the quotes that I've shared, this one will always be in my top five, my top five favorite quotes. Because it speaks to wonder, it speaks to childlike faith, it speaks to never growing up. And here's the point that he makes. He says, a child kicks his legs rhythmically through excess, not absence of life. Because children have a bounding vitality, because they are in spirit, fierce and free. Therefore, they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony. How many of you know what he's talking about with children? Yes. One more time. That's what my kids used to say. But listen to where he takes it. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately but has never gotten tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy for we have sinned and grown old and our father is actually younger than we. Isn't that amazing? So the word that I want to share to you, if you have your Bibles, I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Because Paul is writing, he's writing to a young man that he has been pouring into by the name of Timothy. Now, this is, if you, if you know the passage of scripture where Paul says, listen, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. This is 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is encouraging his young Padawan. I used to think when I heard that, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, that, I don't know, maybe Timothy was like 10 or 12 Do you realize that Timothy, when Paul says that, Timothy's pushing 40. Praise the Lord, we're not old. So he says, listen, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But but Paul is basically saying to keep a sense of wonder. So I want to read this to you. I'm reading verses 10 through 16. And I want to read it from the message translation of the Bible today. Because I love that Paul has some very specific commands that he gives to Timothy. And I think they were good for him. Sixth graders, I think they're good things that you need to know, and for the rest of us, they're important reminders for us as well. So here's what Paul says. Let me read this to you. You can read it on the screens. You've been raised on the message of the faith and have followed sound teaching, talking to Timothy. Now, I want you to pass this counsel to the Christians there, and you'll be a good servant of Jesus. I want you to stay clear of silly stories that get dressed up as religion. Exercise daily in God. No spiritual flabbiness, please. Isn't that not awesome? Translation, don't be a flabby Christian. God is here to pump you up. Kids, ask your parents. Oh, so good. That's right. Okay, we're moving on. (laughs) Please forgive me. Paul says workouts in the gymnasium are useful. It's good to work out. CrossFit, it's great. But a disciplined life in God is far more so. Making you fit both today and forever, you can count on this. Take it to heart. That's why we've thrown ourselves into this venture so totally. We're banking on the, what are those two words? Living God, say that. Living God, we're banking on the living God, savior of all men and women, especially believers. Now, here where he moves into action, here's where he gives three things here that he tells Timothy it's important to remember. First, he says, get the word out. 
Now, I know you can just think that's a verbal thing, but I think it's also a literal thing. Paul is saying, get the word out. Teach all of these things. Don't let anyone put you down because you're young. There it is. But teach believers with your life by word, by demeanor, by love, by faith, by integrity. Stay at your post reading scripture. You are never finished reading the word of God, giving counsel, teaching. That's one. Get the word out. But second, he says this, that special gift of ministry that you were given when the leaders of the church laid hands on you and prayed, keep that dusted off and in use. And lastly, he says, cultivate these things. Immerse yourself in them. The people will all see you mature right before their eyes. Keep a firm grasp on both your character and your teaching. Don't be diverted. Just keep at it. Both you and those who hear you will experience salvation. Three things he speaks of. He speaks of God's word. He speaks of God's gift. And he speaks of God's purpose for your life. So let me start here. Let me start with God's word. Listen to me. Never stop being a student of God's word. You hear me? Never stop being a student of God's word. Let this word that you have spent the year highlighting, tagging, marking, writing in your word, just continue to live into that because listen, the more you put God's word inside you, the more God begins to speak to you through his word. It's amazing how that happens. In fact, all the way in the beginning of Psalms, in Psalms chapter one, the very beginning, there's 150 chapters of Psalms. I love the book of Psalms. But just the very first three verses of Psalms is powerful that speaks to the power of God's word, the power of never stop being a student in God's word. Listen, the writer of Psalms says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night for that person is like a tree that's planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither for whatever they do prospers. Here's, here's an illustration of what it means to just take God's word and let that be a part of who you are. The more you get to know God, the more you dig down deep roots into the soil and the harder the winds blow, the harder circumstances arise when difficult times come and they will come in your life. It is the relationship that you have developed with God that will grow you. Do you guys remember when I came and I talked to you about prayer? Do you remember when I came and I talk to you about prayer. And I gave an illustration. I talked about this pastor by the name of Eugene Peterson. Eugene Peterson, I have a shelf in my, in my office that's really dedicated to a lot of his writings. He just passed away last year. Eugene Peterson, proficient in Hebrew and Greek, he's the one, I read the message translation, he's the one that did the entire Bible and made the message translation. I love him because he had a pastor's heart. You remember what I talked about with prayer? What I talked about with a relationship, what a relationship with God looks like? I talked about um, going to dinner. How many of you love to go out to eat? Come on. How many of you love going out to dinner? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, me too, right? And he said, he's, I'm sorry, what? We have revival breaking out. What are we talking? Are we planning dinner? Are we going to go? Are we good? What's your favorite food right now? Mexican. Mexican, right here. Come on. And all God's people said, amen. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Eugene Peterson, back on track, said, you know, when you, go, when you go out to eat with someone that you love, you sit down at the table and the waiter will come and the waiter will give you a menu and you look at the menu and from the menu, you pick and choose and you decide, okay, what am I gonna have? And maybe you have questions about the menu. Maybe you have questions about certain dishes so you will ask the waiter, well, listen, what is in this? Or, or maybe you will say, look, can you substitute this? And then the waiter goes away and the waiter comes back and you've got your food and maybe it's great and you went, thank you. Or maybe something's wrong and you're like, can you send that back? That's not what I asked. Eugene Peterson said the tragedy for people, for God's children, is that for much of their life, their relationship with God can be just like that who is sitting at a table and God is the waiter, that God is transactional. 
that you spend your life saying, God, I want this, I want this. And maybe you get something that happens to you and you're like, sorry, um, excuse me, uh, Savior, if you could just take that back and just replace it with a side of blessing and prosperity, that would be amazing. We laugh, but let's be real. We could spend an entire life with this relationship with God and it's simply transactional. But here's where I love Pastor Peterson where he lands it. He says, it's not like God is a waiter, but instead the person that you're eating a meal with, that person that you love, let's just say that that's God. That Jesus is the bride. I think about when I go out to eat with my wife, I'm gonna get a little bit mushy right now, so just give me a moment, okay? We've been married for 25 years and, and we'll sit down at a table together and the waiter comes and great, we order our food. But when I'm sitting with my bride, when I'm looking at my wife, we just talk. I talk about my day. I talk about things that I love. I talk about things that I'm scared of. We have this conversation and some of you, I know this is gonna be so hard for you to believe, but there's even moments where I don't speak. I'll just sit at the table and I'll hold her hand because sometimes, this is what I love, you don't have to use words because it's just beautiful being at the table with the one that you love. That's the kind of relationship that God is calling you to. A relationship where you grow, a relationship where you continue to pursue him and as you grow in faith, listen, there is this sweet love that happens in your relationship with the Lord. Never stop being a student of God's word. But second, I would say this, you need to remember that the one who calls you is also the one who equips you, right? Like Paul tells Timothy, listen, be a student of the word, get the word out, but he also says, remember the gifts that you've been given. And when you give your life to Jesus, there is a promise. Jesus gives you something. In John 14, 15, and 16, there's this beautiful moment with Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus is telling them, listen, I'm not going to be with you forever. In fact, I'm going to go and I'm going to be with my father. But I'm not leaving you as orphans. The disciples were so dependent upon Jesus, understandably so. But Jesus looked at his friends. He said, I'm not going to be with you forever. But wait, when I leave... I am sending someone in, the Holy Spirit. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to talk to you through the Spirit. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to see even greater things than you saw with me walking beside you. Isn't that incredible? The gift that you've been given, let's start there. The power of the Holy Spirit that is living and breathing inside you. The gifts of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Don't you love it? These are gifts that as you grow in your relationship, don't you love seeing yourself on the screen? These are gifts that as you grow in your relationship with the Lord, the Spirit is gonna cultivate these things. Use these gifts that God has given you. But the last thing I would say, the last thing I would say is this. You have to devote yourself fully to God. Be all in don't grow up because God wants to use you. Paul, last verse I'm going to share. says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now I brought something that's going to illustrate what I'm, what I'm talking about. You got to promise me you're going to give it a chance. Will you give it a chance? Yes. You're going to promise me you're going to give it a chance? Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay taking a risk here. I'm making myself vulnerable. All right, what is this? Anybody know? This is a glove, right? Specifically, it's a garden glove. And when I see it in the light, I realized it's pretty dirty. So you don't want to shake my hand after it's done. Um, what is the purpose of a garden glove? What would you do with it? You would guard it. You would what? It would protect your hand, right? This garden glove was created to be used to work in the garden. Someone made this. It has a purpose. So now I could say, I could leave this glove here and I could say to this garden glove, glove, I want you to pick up the Bible. You see anything moving? No. Okay. There's a secret. You know what the secret is? I have to encourage it. Watch this. This is amazing. Hey, glove, you were created for such a time as this. Pick up 
the Bible. Any movement at all? You still see nothing? No. Here's what it needs. You ready? This is it. I need to disciple it. I need to instruct it. So, glove, what you do is you take your little floppy thumb here, and then you take this little finger, and you're just going to wrap yourself around. So, here we go. You've been trained. Pick up the Bible. Watch. Nothing still. Okay, one last thing. I think this is going to, you know what? It needs fellowship. It, it just needs a community of gloves. So, Give it like a little multicultural experience here. And that, surely, Glove, pick up the Bible. It's, is it going to work? It's not, it's not going to work. Here's why. Because even though the Glove was created to do the gardening and the work, it can't do work until it has a living hand that fills every single part of it. That's what's going to allow it to do what it was created to do. When a living hand goes inside, fills every piece of it, and gives it the power to do what it was created to do. So brothers and sisters, may you remember, you may just be a garden glove. Congratulations. But you have the power of God who wants to cultivate the soil to grow the kingdom. So here's where I want you to be. Can we turn the house lights up a little bit? Would you guys stand? Stand up for me right now, just the confirmands. And I want you to turn around and I want you to face the community. Here's how I want to end. Church, as you just remain seated, would you just extend a hand towards them? Because I want to say a prayer over them right now as the band comes on the stage. Just bow your heads, hand extended to them. Just close your eyes. Every time I come up here to pray, um, there's a very specific prayer that I pray over myself. But once a year, it's on Confirmation Sunday, I share this prayer for these confirmands. So let this be a prayer for them right now. Gracious and loving God, I thank you for these lives and these hearts. I thank you for the calling that you have placed on them, that they would continue to be students of your word, that, Father, they would continue to live in and out of the gifts that you have given them, that they would be a people who are all in, that, God, you would raise up future ministers, future CEOs, future executives, future students, future teachers who hold up a mirror and reflect the glory of who you are and in doing so change the world so father anoint their eyes that they may see the world as you see the world anoint their ears Lord that they may hear your voice God anoint those precious hands of theirs that they would be the hands that would build and transform your kingdom guard their heart for it is the wellspring of life anoint their feet so that they would walk and take bold steps father towards you and we pray this in the precious name of Jesus and God's people said, amen, amen. Church, let's stand and give him one more hand.